It trips over its feet. It's supposed to look like a wreck. This is a World War One exhibit. No, it's supposed to have it up like this. It was surrounded by ficus trees like a crash in the woods. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, I was going to take a wheel off it, but anyway. It doesn't fly anymore. That's the reason why it's here. Uh, it used to fly all the time, but it's kind of getting tired. and We've got so much other stuff to deal with besides what it's set. So this is about a 1950-1960 F-E-8. It's a First World War fighter. Now the reason why it's built this way is because uh, they were starting to develop forward firing machine guns, the enemy, basically. Uh, and the Allies didn't have that yet, so they figured, okay, we'll take pressure fighters and machine guns can sit in the front and clear field of fire, no problems. Um, Problems no problems with the props. You wouldn't have to synchronize a machine gun through that whirling propeller like you would on something like that. So that's how it was done. Uh, one forward firing those. The early ones had a machine gun that was flexible. You could actually aim the gun, but they decided flying the airplane and trying to aim a gun was almost impossible. So they fixed the gun and steered the airplane. It's much easier to do that. Some of them had cannons. The FEAs had actually a 37 millimeter cannon in the front. 20 millimeter on so the early one. But, um... They put that in their airspeed when we fire that. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. <laughs> they would shake the whole thing to death. Uh, but anyway, like this one, anything that comes off goes through that whirling propeller. And that's always a problem. We got that problem on the Curtis Pusher. You know, the props off right now. I'm going throw it. One screw falls out and it goes through the propeller. First the propeller. So one disadvantage to a pilot was in the event of a crash, you're first on the scene, and so was the gas tank, and then the engine was after that. This big spinning hot engine. So crashes were not uh, pleasant on these uh, kind of airplanes. It's not a great thing that you'd have to put it into something hard. But the cool thing about this is it's got this uh, museum history. This airplane was built in the late 70s, and it flew across the whole United States from California all the way across the United States. I think it was like 30 stops or something like that. All the way, and it landed here, and it was, it was uh, given to the museum, and, and Jack Gardner uh, flew this airplane here for years. Uh, and it's been, it was, like I said, it's been flying since, oh, until 1982, probably five years ago, something like that, I think it was, uh, and then we decided to keep it down. It wasn't very popular with the museum pilots. To, uh, Parker Dutton would fly it. Yeah, he flew it a lot. You know, I changed the prop, and the prop was such a small prop, I got a bigger prop, and it flew a lot better. It is, you didn't have to have a full power all the time. So, but the trouble was, now the diameter is bigger, now you're picking up more junk, so it would get dinged a little bit more. It really needed metal tipping on it. So, uh, and they, if you notice these ducks, it's got a modern 50s engine in it. These air-cooled cylinders, and I understand they really cooked them going through the desert. And when they got it here, Grady Sharp, one of the volunteers here that did all the engineering and construction, uh, put all these duct work on here and all this uh, baffling to cool those cylinders. That is nothing to do with original. Originally, when I had a rotary engine like that puff over there. We actually have something out hanging out in the lobby that would be more like what the right? Yeah, it's a DH2, which is almost the same. So, I have a question. Yeah. What does that stand for? Uh, uh, Farnborough Experimental. Not Fighter Experimental, which you think. It's Farnborough, which was the company, was uh, Farnborough, uh, was the Royal Aircraft Factory mm -hmm. in Farnborough. So it was Farnborough Experimental 8, the 8th model. So it was Fighter FE? No, no. Farnborough Experimental. SE was Scouting Experimental. Mm -hmm. So some of those had names like that, but this was Farnborough Experimental. If this is a pusher aircraft, What's that? That's a tractor. So anything that pushes is a pusher, and that's called a tractor when it gets pulled. Uh, much more efficient. Pushers are not, you think about it, all that stuff, you got struts and wires and nacelles and fuselages in the way. The propeller's back in pretty dirty air, so it's really not an efficient airplane. Uh, they, did their, they did their part, and they really counted the German monoplanes, the Fokker monoplanes that had the forward firing guns. But pretty soon, they were outgunned out everything. So they uh, went into training pretty quick and disappeared. No originals left in the world. There's only two replicas, one here, one in uh, right back in the state yard. That's it. Did they have a two-seat version? Not of this. They had an FE2V, 
but that's a totally different machine. The DH2, there's one hanging out there, is another, it's a de Havilland product, uh, same idea, same idea. And they had a DH1, which is a tube seat version of that. But the FE8 was kind of on its own. But the FE2B was a tube seat version that somewhat looked like it. Just different companies? Mm -hmm. Uh, Were they competing with uh, each other? I'm trying to think. No, I think it was the same company. Same factory? For all our trap factories. To have them. Yeah. Why the centerline armament versus going with something outboard? Was that for dealing with you know jams and rearming? It. it was all about that? Most of the time, you would have to deal with a jam. You'd have to change the drum every 47 rounds on the early one. So there's your drums. Don't drop it. <laughs> uh, they called the DH2s the, the spinning incinerators because the 100 gnome engine, which they put on these two, would lose a cylinder once in a while. And when you lose a cylinder, it just about to, it rips the engine right out of the mouth. The whole thing comes down as a massive jump. You know? So that was the design. So when they first came out with like top of top and they couldn't shoot, they had a machine gun over the top of the wing. But you still had to get the gun down to reload it to fix jams and all that stuff. So you really needed that thing near you to do that. And they didn't have the structure out there to go further out. I have seen experimental stuff laid out there, but uh, you need to come right there. Jams were big. It wasn't really uh, standardized ammunition. You know, they were jammed in there. But what was your speed in the airspeed? Airspeed, they probably did around 85. Surprising. To 90. Of course, back then, you didn't know. You'd, a lot of specs lie. You get into right into the Woodward Piper Cup, all stuff, they're a big lie because they're just the perfect conditions, full power. I mean, right. it's everything. You never get that when you're in a situation. So I think 80 mile an hour is probably a pusher. So they're pretty slow. Look at look at all the drag on these things. Oh, yeah. We talked drag last time. This is just a massive drag. Right here. Yeah. But they're pretty maneuverable for the time. And compared to its opponents? The central powers, how does it work? Well, the Fokker Eindecker, that's a monoplane, um, it it did well, favored against that. But they, the Germans, were coming out with the Albatross fighters. Against the Albatross, it was double the horsepower, two guns, um, especially pups. When pups were around, too, the pups were just after this. The pups could handle uh, combat at high altitudes. They were light, a lot of wing. They could hold their own at 15,000 and above, but if they got lower, the Albatross was good. And wipe them out. The Germans they weren't such big wings in every airplane, so they didn't do well at high altitudes. But when they came down, they were just better. So they had a very short time in history, these yeah. airplanes. They did their thing and then they were gone. The FE 2B went right through the war, though. You say, I mean, it's a two seat, it kind of looks like this. It's not the same design, but um, pushers did go through the war reliably, but, but just they were just slow, <laughs> you know, bombers and stuff. With the uh, Fokker done, is this on your list to be recovered? Oh, um, I don't know. Yeah. There's other things. There's yeah. other things ahead. Then that's the five gun. Yeah. So I mean, it it did look cool going home. It was a great thing. You know, we did this formation. The FE8 spat new forces. Do we have any video on the Fokker Eindecker that we did, we did, I mean, we have, I have Charlie Gaiman, we did yeah. some air-to-air -air wow. stuff and GoPro. I'm glad you mentioned that. Did, what does Charlie transplant? play? Charlie liked to play this thing. <laughs> it, it was always fun when we get the pick. We're going to pull the spat first and the second guy's in the It's like, okay, Fred's not here. He gets to fly this thing. So no one wanted to fly this. But Charlie did. He, he didn't mind it. John Thompson used to love There's some certain people, and Tom even said he had kind of a weird kind of smile it was really joyful, but it was okay. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, it is the weird. I still remember the first flight I ever made this thing. It was pretty cool. It was a Thursday night, right after a rainstorm. And I remember cutting around right over the ocean here, and there's big billowing white cloud and a big rainbow right over the ocean. It was the coolest thing because the your view, you're sitting out in front of everything, yeah. is yeah. the coolest thing in the world. But that is a disadvantage for flying that way because you don't have a reference of the machine in the sky. You can't tell how high you're going because you're just sitting out in front. You kind of got to look back at the wings and say, yeah, I'm too high an angle. It's, gonna... it's interesting. How come all the uh, control wires are not as 
externally on this and internally on this? Well, it depends. Poker, you could do it internally because thick wings. You could put a lot of things inside. These are really thin wings, so you really couldn't get the thing. Uh, you'd have to put them outside. Of course, that's pure drag. Uh, yeah, if you look at most early stuff, it's all outside. Spaz, and of course, they started getting into push rods, push tubes, and belt cranks, and all that stuff. But that was a little bit more advanced than this. This was still old technology. Pushers, you know, they had pusher air propeller, right, buttons? I mean, you know, pushers from the beginning. But, yeah, you can just add things as you want. So the fact that it's on its nose, is that just because it's past its center of gravity? Does it, it, is it fine existing tail oh, gosh, down? Yeah. It'll sit like that all day without any heat. I gotta see. It, it doesn't naturally fall. Well, I mean, it doesn't. It, 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 it right. could though. It's not like a long easy. It, it stub its nose, yeah, exactly. No, it's just that way that it would sit there quite nicely. We could put stuff underneath it. It was a World War One exhibit that went in. Right. We decided, hey, but when you, I mean, when you came in and landed the thing, it didn't actually want to nosedive into the ground, did it? No, but if you hit something, that's the first thing. That's the first thing would happen. Uh, it is a steel tube structure, and that's original actually for these FBAs. But still, uh, you wouldn't want to hit hard. You're right there. This originally did not have a gas tank in the front. That mm -hmm. was put in the nose built. That gas tank was molded like the airplane for this flight going across the country. Because you know you're going. Hours at a time, you're out in the desert, there's not airfields every you know, 20 miles. Well, where was the original one in the back? Sent along the yes, back? it would right behind the pilot, would be a fuselage tank with a castor oil tank. So if you look at like that top of the cup, they built a single tank and they had a small part for the castor oil mm -hmm. and the gas. So that, that's the whole thing about that. You need a lot of oil for rotary engines, they burn a lot, mm -hmm. a gallon an hour. Uh, Non, those right out you know, on a rotary engine. So. so, general question yeah. um, that's been brought up to me: planes that relied on a drag brake, how did that affect, you know, as far as the fields, the runways? Obviously, you're, if you're dragging this thing behind you, you're chewing that up. The next plane that lands down, it's got rough ground to land on. How was that handled on? For a vehicle, I mean, that, did that did that impact where they were flying from? Care of their well, you think in World War One, aerodromes were basically a mile square field, and you could land into the wind all the time. So, I mean, they had tail skids, and sure, they, in the muddy stuff, they're going to drag it up. I've done lots of that. Uh, how much are you going to do? I suppose if you land in the same place over and over, you're going to take right. it up. But you look at ours out there, and that's healed. You can't tell a tail skids run on it. Uh, if you were out there, like I said, muddy conditions, you don't. We'll put a right, right down, right down the line. But but they didn't use a lot of keels back then either. You put keels on these things to keep them straight. What you want to do is keep the airplane straight, and that's putting skegs and all that stuff to keep it straight. Because the airplane wants to swap ends. I think we might have talked about that last time. Take a tricycle and roll it down the hill. It wants to just roll straight, but if you turn it around, it does not. It wants to swap around. And that's the same thing. The pilot has all he can do, especially like a triplane or something. To keep the tail in the back and the nose in the front, huh. but but they had just fields, and that's you know that's why you see the outfit they had joppers because it was all from the cavalry. You know they had riding horses out in the field, so they had flying boots because they're in these nasty conditions. So flying fields were literally flying fields; they were just fields. There was no you know, really airports or anything like that. And tail wheels came out well after. Because they had airfields. So these are meant to be flown out of fields. Just flat fields and plants. Yeah, A minor. He gives A minor. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the rag? The rag used to denote the squadron leader. So you could tell right in combat who was your leader, you know, and if you were told to stay this way or that way, that was your man. Right? Here just, here's another thing that adds drag to the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Those flapping the but you could see this. You could see streamers. No radio no sign. There was no radio. Yeah. So back then, no parachutes, no radios, no heat. I mean, it's like pups. I think you might have talked about Those soft with pups get sidetracked, but they would go to 18,000 feet. No oxygen, no heat. 
Okay. Three degrees drop for every thousand feet. Exactly. So you imagine what it is on a cool day, what it is up there. Uh, pretty amazing. And this one, what was the ceiling on this? Oh, I bet you this thing is not very high. 12, 15,000 maybe? I don't know. I don't know. It, it depends on the range, you know, how long fuel you have. Anything I mean, under 10,000 you have to have oxygen? Well, today. Today, yeah. yeah. OSHA, you know, <laughs> OSHA. You gotta have oxygen, but 20,000 back then. And it just does things. You know, they had a lot of problems when balloonists, aeronauts, oh, aeronauts back then, would go up higher than Zeppelins, you know, with Bob, Eng Bob England. They had some height climbers, they called them height climbers, and they would go up to 26, 20, way up there, but they were bleeding through the nose, passing out, dying, you know, it was, yeah. it'll mess you up. You can't think straight. So you can only go so much. Now the later fighters in the war, actually like the Southwest Knight, actually had oxygen. Uh, they had oxygen set up. So they were getting pretty advanced. Again, wartime. Any you know, Wartime advances technology. So the beginning of the war, no, it was only two years later the war was over, and that's when they had oxygen. They were all metal airplanes. They were really developing stuff out, just like World War II, right at the end. But the thing about this airplane is there's museum history here. I mean, it's a, it's a World War I airplane, but this has a story to tell because it was flown, built, flown across the entire country, and it came to Alice Hesley. And it's here, because of that reason. He decided, I don't know if it was a deal before he built it, I don't know what the, what the tie, how Jack was tied before he brought this thing to him, because this was really his first deal. Uh, Jack was also involved with that Curtis Pusher, the same guy. Uh, then they had a Belonka monoplane that they had. So he was involved with a lot of airplanes that were here. So Jack Gardner is a pretty big figure in the museum. So that was... Why is it on the <laughs> There you go, that's the question I want. It trips over its feet. It's supposed to look like a wreck. This is the World War I exhibit. It's supposed to have it up like this. It was surrounded by ficus trees, like the crack <laughs> Yeah, I was going to take a wheel off it, but anyway, it doesn't fly anymore. That's the reason why it's here. Uh, it used to fly all the time, but it's kind of getting tired, and we've got so much other stuff to deal with besides what it's set. So this is about a 1950-1960 FE8. It's a First World War fighter. Now, the reason why it's built this way is because uh, they were starting to develop forward-firing machine guns, the enemy, basically. Uh, and the Allies didn't have that yet, so they figured, okay, we'll take pressure fighters, and machine guns can sit in the front, and clear field of fire, no problem. Um, no problems with the props. You wouldn't have to synchronize the machine gun through that whirling propeller, like you would on something like that. So that's how it was done. Uh, one forward firing those. The early ones had a machine gun that was flexible. You could actually aim the gun, but they decided flying the airplane and trying to aim a gun was almost impossible. So they fixed the gun and steered the airplane. It was much easier to do that. Some of them had cannons. The FE8s had actually a 37 millimeter cannon in the front, 20 millimeter on this one, the early one. But, um, they cut down their airspeed when we fire that. Yeah, I would think so. <laughs> I think we'd shake the whole thing to death. Uh, but anyway, like this one, anything that comes off goes through that whirling propeller. And that's always a problem. We got that problem on the Curtis Pusher. You notice the prop's off right now. I'm going to throw it. One screw falls out and it goes through the propeller, first the propeller. So one disadvantage to a pilot was in the event of a crash, you're first on the scene and so was the gas tank and then the engine was after that. This big spinning high engine. So crashes were not uh, pleasant on the uh, on the thing that you'd have to put it into something hard. But the cool thing about this is it's got this uh, museum history. This airplane was built in the late 70s and it flew across the whole United States from California all the way across the United States. I think it was like 30 stops or something like that. All the way and it landed here and it was it was uh, given to the museum and, and Jack Gardner uh, flew this airplane here for years. Uh, and it's been, it was, like I said, it's been flying since Oh, until 1982, probably five years ago, something like that, five, six years ago. And then we decided to keep it down. It wasn't very popular with the museum pilots. Uh, 
Parker Dunton would fly it. Yeah, he flew it a lot. You know, I changed the prop, and the prop was such a small prop. I got a bigger prop, and it flew a lot better. It did, you didn't have to have a full power all the time. So but the trouble was, now the diameter is bigger. Now you're picking up more junk. So it would get dinged a little bit more. It really needed metal tipping on it. So, uh, I mean, if you notice these ducks, it's got a modern 50s engine in it. These air-cooled cylinders, and I understand they really cooked them going through the desert. And when they got here, Grady Sharp, one of the volunteers here that did all the engineering and construction, uh, put all these duct work on here and all this uh, baffling to cool those cylinders. That is nothing to do with the original. Originally, when I had a rotary engine yeah. like that pop over there. We actually have something out, hanging out in the lobby. Yeah, it's a DH2, which is almost the same. So, I have a question. Yeah. At the what does that stand for? Uh, Farnborough Experimental. Not Fighter Experimental, which you would think. It's Farnborough, which was, the company was uh, Farnborough, uh, was the Royal Aircraft Factory mm -hmm. in Farnborough. So it was Farnborough Experimental 8, the 8th model. So it wasn't Fighter at No, no. Farnborough Experimental. SE was Scouting Experimental. So some of those had names like that, but this was Farnborough Experimental. If this is a pusher aircraft, What's that? That's a tractor. So anything that pushes is a pusher, and that's called a tractor when it gets pulled. Uh, much more efficient. Pushers are not, you think about it, all that stuff, you got struts and wires and nacelles and fuselages in the way. The propeller's back in pretty dirty air, so it's really not an efficient airplane. Uh, they, did their, they did their part, and they really counted the German monoplanes, the Fokker monoplanes that had the four fired guns. But pretty soon, they were outgunned out everything. So they uh, went into training pretty quick and disappeared. No originals left in the world. There's only two replicas, one here, one in uh, right back in the state yard. That's it. Did they have a two-seat version? Not of this. They had an FE2V, but that's a totally different machine. The DH2, there's one hanging out there, is another, it's a de Havilland product. Uh, same idea, same idea. And they had a DH1, which is a two-seat version of that. But the FE8 was kind of on its own. But the FE2B was a two-seat version that somewhat looked like. Just different companies? Mm -hmm. uh, Were they competing uh, with each other? I'm trying to think. No, I think it was the same company. Same factory? Royal Archive factory. To have yeah. yeah. Why the center line armament versus going with something outboard? Was that for dealing with you know jams and rearming? You got it. it was all about that? Most of the time, you would have to deal with a jam, you have to change the drum every 47 rounds on the early one. So there's your drums, don't drop it. <laughs> drop it. Uh, they call the DH2s the, the spinning incinerators because the 100 gnome engine, which they put on these two, would lose a cylinder once in a while. And when you lose a cylinder, it's just about to, it rips the engine right out of the mouth, the whole thing comes down as a massive jump. So that was the design. So when they first came out with like top of top and they couldn't shoot, they had a machine gun over the top of the wing. But you still had to get the gun down to reload it to fix jams and all that stuff. So you really needed that thing in the area to do that. And they didn't have a structure out there to go further out. I have seen experimental stuff laid out there, but uh, you need to jump right there. Jams were big. It wasn't really uh, standardized ammunition. You know, they were jammed. But what was your standard airspeed? Airspeed, they probably did around 85. <laughs> Surprising to 90. Of course, back then, you know, you, a lot of specs lie. You get into right into the Woodward and Piper Cup, all stuff, they're a big lie because they're just the perfect conditions, full power. I mean, right. it's everything. You never get that when you're in a situation. So. I think 80 mile an hour is probably a pusher, so they're pretty slow. Look at look at all the drag on these things. Oh, yeah. We talked drag last time. This is just a massive drag right here. Mm -hmm. But they're pretty maneuverable for the time. And compared to its opponent, the Central Powers, how does it work? Well, the Fokker Eindecker, this monoplane, um, it it did well, favored against that. But they, the Germans were coming out with the Albatross fighters. Against the Albatross, it was double the horsepower, two guns, um, especially pups. When pups were around too, the pups were just after this. The pups could handle uh, combat at high altitudes. They were light, a lot of wing. 
they can hold their own at 15,000 and above, but if they got lower, the albatrosses could, could wipe them out. The Germans they weren't such big wings of heavier airplanes, so they didn't do well at high altitudes. But when they came down, they were just better. So they had a very short time of history, these airplanes. They did their thing and then they were gone. The FE 2B went right through the war, you say. I mean, it's a two seat, it kind of looked like this. It's not the same design, but um, pushers did go through the war. But just they were just slow, <laughs> you know, bombers and stuff like that. Plotted along. With the uh, Fokker done, is this all on your list to be recovered? Oh, um, I don't know. Yeah. There's other things. There's yeah. other things ahead. That that's the five gun. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it it did look cool going home. It was a great thing. You know, we did this formation. The FE8 spat new forces. We did, we did, I mean, we have, I have with Charlie Gaiman, we did yeah. some air to air wow. stuff and GoPro. I'm glad you mentioned that, because what does this Charlie transplant? play? Charlie liked flying this thing. <laughs> it, it was always fun when we get the pick. We're going to pull the spat first and the second guy's in Newport. It's like, okay, Fred's not here. <laughs> he gets to fly this thing. So no one wanted to fly this. But Charlie did. He, he didn't mind it. John Thompson used to love There's some certain people, and Tom even said he had kind of a weird kind of smile. It wasn't really joyful, but it was okay. He survived. <laughs> he survived. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it is the weird. I still remember the first flight I ever made this thing. It was pretty cool. It was a Thursday night, right after a rainstorm. And I remember cutting around right over the ocean here, and these big billowing white clouds and the big rainbow right over the ocean. It was the coolest thing because the your view, you're sitting out in front of everything, yeah. is yeah. the coolest thing in the world. But that is a disadvantage for flying that way because you don't have a reference of the machine in the sky. You can't tell how high you're going because you're just sitting out in front. You kind of got to look back at the wings and say, yeah, I'm too high an angle. It's interesting. How come all the uh, control wires are not externally on this and internally on this? Well, it depends. Fokker, you could do it internally because thick wings. You could put a lot of things inside. These are really thin wings, so you really couldn't get the thing. Uh, you'd have to put them outside. Of course, that's pure drag. Uh, yeah, if you look at most early stuff, it's all outside. Spad, and of course, they started getting into push rods, push tubes, and bell cranks, and all that stuff. But that was a little bit more advanced than this. This was still old technology. Pushers, you know, they had pusher air propeller, right, buttons? I mean, you know, pushers from the beginning. But, yeah, you just add things as you went. So the fact that it's on its nose, is that just because it's past its center of gravity? Does it, it is it fine existing tail oh, down? Yeah. It'll sit like that all day without any pain. I got to It doesn't naturally fall. But I mean, it does it. It, does, it right. could though. It's not like a long easy. It, it stub its nose, yeah, exactly. No, it's just that way that it would sit there quite nicely. We could put stuff underneath it. It was a World War One exhibit that went in. Right. We decided, hey, we could put this but when you, I mean, when you came in and landed the thing, it didn't actually want to nosedive into the ground, did it? No, but if you hit something, that's the first thing. That's the first thing would happen. Uh, it is a steel tube structure, and that's original actually for these FBAs. But still, uh, you wouldn't want to hit hard. You're right there. This originally did not have a gas tank in the front. That mm -hmm. was put in the nose built. That gas tank was molded like this. The airplane for this flight going across the country. Because you know you're going hours at a time. You're out in the desert. There's not airfields every you know 20 miles. Well, where was the original one in the back? Sent along. The yes, back? it would right behind the pilot be a fuselage tank with a castor oil tank. So if you look at like that top of the cup, they built a single tank and they had a small part for the castor oil mm -hmm. and the gas. Oil. So that that's the whole thing about that. You need a lot of oil for rotary engines. A gallon an hour. Uh, non goes right out you know, on a rotary engine. So, so a general question yeah. um, that's been brought up to me: planes that relied on a drag brake. How did that affect you know as far as the fields, the runways? Obviously, you're, if you're dragging this thing behind you, you're chewing that up. The next plane that lands down, it's got rough ground to land on. How was that handled on? 
for a vehicle. I mean, that, did, that, did that impact where they were flying from, care of their... Well, you think in World War I, aerodromes were basically a mile square field. And you could land into the wind all the time. So, I mean, they had tail skids, and sure, they, in the muddy stuff, they're going to drag it up. I've done lots of that. Uh, how much are you going to do? I suppose if you land in the same place over and over, you're going to take right. it up. But you look at ours out there, I mean, that field, you can't tell a tail skid's running on it. Uh, if you were out there, like I said, muddy conditions, you'll, you'll put a, you know, right, right, down, right down the line. But, but they didn't use a lot of keels back then either. You put keels on these things to keep them straight. What you want to do is keep the airplane straight. And that's putting skegs and all that stuff to keep it straight. Because the airplane wants to swap out. I think we might have talked about that last time. Take a tricycle and roll it down the hill. It wants to just roll straight. But if you turn it around, it does not. It wants to swap around. And that's the same thing. The pilot has all he can do, especially like a triplane or something, to keep the tail in the back and the nose in the front. But, but they had just fields. And that's... You know, that's why you see the outfit, they had jockers because it was all from the cavalry. You know, they had riding horses out in the field. So they had flying boots because they're in these nasty conditions. So flying fields were literally flying fields. They were just fields. There was no you know, really airports or anything like that. And tail wheels came out well after the war. You know, it was late 20s, because <coughs> they had airplanes. So these are meant to be flown out of fields. squadron leader. So you could tell right in combat who was your leader, you know, and if you were told to stay this way or that way, that was your man right there. So here's just here's another thing that adds drag to the airplane. Well, <laughs> yeah. Those flapping the but you could see this. You could see streamers. No radio no back enemy, then. There was no radio. Yeah. So back then no parachutes, no radios, no heat. I mean it's like pups, I think you might have talked about. Those soft the pups get sidetracked, but they would go to eighteen thousand feet. No oh, oxygen, man. no heat, no Three radio. degrees drop for every thousand feet. Exactly. So you imagine what it is on a cool day, what it is up there. Uh, pretty amazing. This one, what was the ceiling on this? Oh, I bet you this thing, not very high, 12, 15,000 maybe, I don't know. I don't know. It, it depends on the range, you know, how long fuel you have. Anything I mean, at 10,000, you have to have oxygen? Well, today, yeah. OSHA, you know, <laughs> OSHA, you got to have oxygen, but 20,000 back then, and it just does things, you know, they had a lot of problems when the balloonists, aeronauts, oh, aeronauts back then, would go up higher than the Zeppelins, you know, with Bob, Eng Bob England, they had some height climbers, they called them height climbers, and they would go up to 26, 20, way up there, but they were bleeding through the nose, passing out, dying, you know, it was, yeah. it'll mess you up. You can't think straight. So you can only go so much. Now, the later fighters in the war, actually, like the Southwest Knight, actually had oxygen. Uh, they had oxygen set up. They were getting pretty advanced. Again, wartime. Any you know, wartime advances technology. Advances. So the beginning of the war, no, it was only two years later the war was over, and that's when they had all metal airplanes. They're really developing stuff fast, just like World War II. Right at the end, and the Germans were way ahead. But the thing about this airplane is there's museum history here. I mean, it's a, it's a World War I airplane, but this has a story to tell because it was flown, built, flown across the entire country, and it came to Alice And it's here. That's another reason. I don't know if it was a deal before he built it, I don't know what the what the tie, how Jack was tied before he brought this thing here, because this was really his first deal. Uh, Jack was also involved with that Curtis Pusher, the same guy. Uh, and they had a Belonka monoplane that they had, so he was involved with a lot of airplanes that were here. Jack Gardner is a pretty big figure in the museum. He and Jim Rockefeller hooked up. Yeah. About the time uh, of the Curtis Pusher. Yeah. Yeah. The probably. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> no. Possibly oh, in certain but, company, yes. Uh, yeah. But, but, <laughs> but yeah, so so yeah, I think it was Jim. Jim was the big aviation guy. And, right. And but I don't know if they I 
I think he donated the airplane. He didn't, they didn't buy it or anything. He, he brought it here, and I think Jack lived here, right? He must have, because he flew it here for a while. Summer. Right? Summers. He summered here. Okay. He was out in California. I don't know how Jim and... Sonoma. Uh, hmm? Sonoma. 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 Yep. Yeah. But uh, I don't know how Jim discovered the C Curtis Pusher or Jack Gardner. I don't know that. Yeah. But I know they were buddies. And the uh, Curtis Pusher was built out there. Yeah, and I think around, I think it first flew in about 1967. Right. Right. And that was early, that was well before this place. So, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, and that was, right. that was You know what, the Curtis Pusher came here for you. Yeah, so that was right. the, the first airplane here, right. basically, was that Curtis Pusher. Right. Uh, it's been talked that that Waco down there was the first, but Leo, according to Leo, that Curtis Pusher was the first airplane here. It was shipped here, they took it apart in California, shipped it here in pieces. Yeah. But then the, that's what they were meant to do. Well, that's a, right. that's a talk for another day. Right. But then they took up the <laughs> idea gonna, from the Spoiler FDA. alert. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. But that was something I think that Jack had always wanted to do. Probably. And, uh, and, and now the museum was part of him too. Right. So they came yeah. up with the idea. Jack's long gone now, but... Um, so, so there's the airplane. Um, it sure could be more authentic. You know, um, this is definitely kind of a fulfill look like an FD. You know, it's a representation. His wife would follow him across. She would really? drive and meet him where they were going to land. That had to be one heck of a thing. I tell you, once around the path is enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you go, you fly this thing around, and you can imagine going through the desert, okay. through the mountain passes, and the whole. You really got to go through passes. Does the FE-8 that Ryan Beck has have a world engine or yeah. a model? Is it world And that airplane, actually, part of it to the Smithsonian Institute, has been down there for years. A cutaway to show what it was like to fly one of these yeah. early airplanes. Yeah. 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 No, it's a reproduction, but it's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Pretty accurate. And that would only be, you know, 30 days, 100 miles a day. Yeah. A couple hours a day. I remember him saying that uh, he followed I-80 through the Rockies, and yeah. th that going through Utah and Colorado was oh, I bet. interesting. Uh, I, bet. I can't imagine, because I tell you what, you can barely, anyone can reach in there and grab a stick, you can barely move these ailerons. You're moving half the wing out there, you're yeah. just you're bending the stick to move it. So it's not a fun thing to fly. You know, when it's calm air, like I say, with everything here, when it's calm air, everything's a joy. But when the wind starts to blow, it's just not fun in some of these airplanes. And that's close to Maine, it's always windy here. So that's why we tend to fly in the morning. So if you ever wonder why we're flying in the morning, of course, it on the phone, we fly earlier because before the wind picks up, 11 o'clock, the wind's starting to pick up, it changes. You know, it changes. It's Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Six in the morning, having pre-war cars, uh, pre-war airplanes, all the Pioneer stuff, and we had Curtis and the Marmon and the Tau and all the stuff flying in the morning and having this really up close and personal thing and having breakfast here. We never did, but it would have been a great thing. The only problem was that I always saw it's like you never know what the weather is. Right. Doing students, sure. like, oh, it looks like it's going to forecast for nice in the morning, and at five in the morning it's starting to blow. Like, yeah. So how do you cancel that thing? before everyone shows up here. The, the thing that I would do is the evening flights. And that's what they do with those shuttle work. And that's what I do students, is because you know it's going to calm down. You're like at three or four, you know, you know it's, it's dying down and it's going to be beautiful. You don't know in the morning, it's only going to get windier in the morning. You know, you could, by the time you're ready to go, you take off and it's starting to get rough. And it's never nice in the morning. But the evenings, and that gives people more time to get there. It would be a cool thing. 
the evening on an evening uh, calm night, it's a joy, and you can do everything. Old cars, just want to dress up. So it's it's something to think about. You know, Steve pushed that. He was really asked all the time about that. Mm -hmm. But that's it. The because the, the tab, you can really demonstrate the tab and fly it nicely when it's calm. When it's when it starts to blow, you just you know it's just not a great flight, and you can see that oh, yeah. it's not a great flight. And again, if it's not a public thing, if it was like a members only thing, because that's what I just talked about. The member only. You remember, you come here into a special thing. You can really get up close and right there, and so like face open flight and everything right there. That's it. They got to drive home tonight. But we got all day to get do something in the museum all day. We're getting ready for this thing at night. And and the traffic dies down here quite a lot. When I do students late at night, I might get one flying airplane, one or two. But that's about it. You know, during the day, it's just nonstop traffic. And you're waiting for the, you know, you're waiting. And just, you really can't make a demonstration properly with all this traffic. You wait for jets. But at night, it's a cool thing. Go ahead and wiggle that stick. <laughs> really, side to side. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put some flight forces on it and it's even worse. Mm -hmm. So you're basically two handed trying to just steer this thing just to hurt it around. <laughs> Gotta love that compass, too, <laughs> sitting right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a trouble. A lot of English stuff. They had a compass right in front of you. That the tiger mouse was right there. Just a great spot for a smash at it. The first thing you hear is compass. Now they were really, they were right there. They were horrible. It was just like the worst place in the world for a compass. But that was an important instrument of a compass back then. And it's, a, it's an instrument that's about the only instrument that won't fail. A compass. Because you're like a million mile an hour and you spiral right into the ground. He's actually going to lie. That's the theory. And with Amelia Earhart shopping in New Jersey, so they say. But that's what happened. So that's so so disorient. So they would spin these things out of airplane. This a real quick thing about the F-8 is there's so many stories about what it was, but they claim the F-8 was the first one to get out of the spin in a normal way, full forward, right rudder, because things were sort sort of new still. So. Because the normal thing when you get into a spin, and these spin easy because between stall and proof, there's there's a speed range about that. So they would spin, so uh, people would pull back. <laughs> the ground's coming up. Well, that's the worst thing you're doing a spin. But pushing forward was another trust thing. The first one that did that was uh, knew he was going to die. <laughs> that's where you're always going to have it. What do you have to lose? Push forward, and it came around. So yeah, so they would actually do that. I've heard stories about formations going up in clouds. And I don't know how they stayed together. Or how they didn't hit. Oh my gosh, I'm sure most of them did. Uh, you know, and there's, but you would spin out of the clouds. It's the safest way. Also, my crowd. Thank you. You got it. All right. Thanks again, Carl. Have fun.